I V M. Dear listeners, here is a riddle for you. I am ubiquitous. I am everywhere. Like oxygen, I am something you cannot live without. And yet, you take me for granted. Over the centuries, I have been made of salt, butter, coconut, tea, rice, tobacco, seashells, animal skin, almonds, gold, silver, iron, and even paper. You cannot live without me. And sometimes, it seems that you cannot live with me. Who am I? Welcome to the Seen and the Unseen, our weekly podcast on economics, politics, and behavioral science. Please welcome your host. Amit Varma. Welcome to the scene in the unseen. Before I reveal the answer to my riddle, I'll tell you what the answer is not. It's not art. Sadly, art is not a constant presence in our lives, and most of us can only admire it from a distance. Until now, our sponsors for this episode, a company called Indian Colors, has made it its mission to make the best fine art easily accessible to art lovers everywhere. Indian Colors licenses images from top Indian artists and adapts it into beautiful objects of everyday use. They have home decor like cushion covers and table runners. They have accessories like tote bags. And what I particularly like is their wearables, their kaftans, shrugs, and stoles. On languid summer afternoons, I recline by the lake wearing nothing but a soothing stole from Indian Colors. Artists get royalties on each product sold, just like authors do for books. And some of the artists you'll find featured are luminaries like Samir Mondal, Dhruvi Acharya, Brinda Miller, Shruti Nelson, and Harain Vakil. Head on over to IndianColors.com. That's colors with an OU to check out their offerings. Use the code IVM20. IVM for Indus Fox Media 20 for a 20% discount. IVM20 is the code at indiancolors.com, colors with an OU. And now, moving on from art to money. Yes, the answer to the riddle is money, which is all around us, almost as essential as oxygen, and it's been made through the centuries of salt, butter, coconut, tea, rice, tobacco, seashells, animal skin, almonds, gold, silver, and iron. And is now usually made either of paper, which is easy to print, or of bits and bytes, which are easy to replicate. That makes it easy money. And my guest today is a columnist and author who has written an entire trilogy of books called the Easy Money Trilogy. Vivek Kaul, welcome to The Scene in the Unseen. Thanks, Amit, for having me. Vivek, your trilogy came out a few years back, but you've been writing about easy money even recently in the context of uh, recent events. Before we get to that, can you explain to me what the concept of easy money is? So basically, uh, I mean, there is, uh, you know, it's it's more of a journalistic term, uh, which was created uh, in the aftermath of uh, the financial crisis, which started in September 2008, when Lehman Brothers, which was the fourth largest investment bank on Wall Street, went bankrupt. Uh, in the, uh, you know, Lehman Brothers went bankrupt on September 15th, 2008. In and around then, many other financial institutions uh, had to be rescued by governments. This included uh, the American insurance group AIG, which was bailed out by the American government on September 16th, uh, 2008, a day after Lehman Brothers went bust. Because if uh, AIG had uh, been allowed to uh, fail, many other financial institutions, uh, including Goldman Sachs, which is uh, by far the biggest investment bank on Wall Street, would have failed as well. So, to prevent that, uh, a lot of uh, you know these financial institutions were rescued, and this essentially goes against the entire idea of free market capitalism, where if something is failing, it needs to be allowed to be failed. But I mean that did not happen. Uh, in and then uh, in the months uh, you know after September 2008, uh, the Federal Reserve of the United States, which is the American Central Bank, and other Western Central Banks, including the Bank of England, decided to print money. And uh, the idea was to sort of flood the financial system with a lot of money so that interest rates fall and the people and companies borrow and spend more. And uh, because of that, the economy would recover and everybody would live happily ever after. 
so that was basically the concept of easy money now uh, what happens is you know when a central bank uh, which includes the federal reserve also prints money it cannot like load that money onto a helicopter and you know then go out there and throw that money into the economy right that's not that's not possible so what it does instead is the money that it prints or rather creates digitally these days uh, it uses it to buy bonds okay and when it buys the, those bonds the money gets into the financial system and one, once the money there is a lot of money going around in the financial system then interest rates start to fall so what the american central bank the federal reserve decided to do was it decided to print money and buy two kinds of bonds one uh, was the <clears throat> american treasury bond which is basically the you know bonds issued by the american government to finance its its fiscal deficit and the second kind of bonds were the called the mortgage backed securities now mortgage backed securities were essentially uh, securitized uh, financial securities which had uh, been derived from uh, mortgages which in india we call home loans so uh, they bought these two uh, securities and the reason they did that was because a lot of these financial institutions had these uh, bonds but nobody was willing to buy them now what happens is you know when when any financial crisis starts people who have cash institutions which have cash try and hold on to that cash nobody wants to you know go out in into the market and trade now in order to sort of uh, untangle that the federal reserve had to step in and they had to buy these bonds now a central bank buying and selling government bonds is uh, you know well known they do that to you know carry out what are known as open market operations but a central bank buying private financial securities like the federal reserve did by buying mortgage backed securities uh, is not something which was very well known uh, till that point of time so uh, as i said the entire idea was to buy these securities pump money into the financial system hope that the interest rates fall uh, hope that people borrow more companies borrow more uh, the wealth effect kicks in so on and so forth and you know the uh, economy sort of uh, comes out of trouble but what happened was uh, you know all of this and a lot more and uh, so we are sort of uh, you know still seeing the effects of the easy money policy which was uh, initiated by the uh, american federal reserve nearly 10 years back and and before i uh, you know ask you to elaborate on the easy money aspect of it and i'm going to take you both back in time and forward in time from where you just left off it's uh, i'll i'll just point out that you know people often think of it as capitalism gone wrong but if you think of the bailouts themselves uh, there's there they're what economists call moral hazard where when a company mm-hmm. bails out banks what it does is it creates incentive for them to continue being irresponsible in future because they know that taxpayers money will be there to bail them out this is sort of a, a way of privatizing profits but socializing losses if the company does well it keeps the profits but if it does badly we the taxpayers have to bail them out and this is contrary to all principles of free market capitalism it's a terrible thing and cronyism is really the only acceptable term for it but that detour aside yes. so i just wanted to add to what you were saying uh you know one of the economists uh, in the 20th century who was by far uh, i mean the most uh, red economist in the sense that he used to write the most in the popular media was john kenneth galbraith and galbraith uh, had to say this he said in america there is only one kind of socialism and that is socialism for the rich so this is uh, a very you know the the bailing out of uh, you know the likes of uh, aig and goldman sachs uh i mean goldman sachs was near not technically bailed out but you know the moment they bailed out aig they also bailed out goldman sachs was obviously uh you know very good example of what uh, galbraith said and uh, you know in 2008 when the entire uh, uh, you know thing was breaking out the american treasury secretary uh, henry paulson was a former chairman of goldman sachs so you know i mean the links are uh, between uh, wall street and uh, the american government are so deep that uh, you know whenever uh, a crisis occurs uh, the government by default will 
have to come to a rescue no so, and the thing to note here is that this was bipartisan that yes. there was a consensus across both the major parties the republicans and the democrats that the bailout is yes, necessary yes because you know what what really happened was that between ben bernanke and uh, henry paulson uh, you know both of them sh- you know really shared the skit you know shit out of uh, these uh, you know congressmen and senators so they really did not have an option you know when there are books i think one of these books was uh, Uh, written by Andrew Ross Sorkin, uh, in which uh, too big to fail, too big to fail, yeah, and in which I think either Barnan K, I think it was Barnan K who said that we may not have an economy on Monday morning, yeah. when they were you know negotiating these things. No, the fascinating the thing so. is that a lot of those congressmen and senators won't have the expertise to evaluate that for themselves. So you have to take the word of the expert yes. who's giving it to you, and that word of the expert has a lot of perverse incentives. Like all the political parties essentially get funded by special interest groups, which are basically big. lobbies and big companies right. so that's i mean what do you do about that but let's get back to sort of easy money and before i ask you to sort of um, come forward and talk about the consequence of the pumping of this easy money into the system um one of the observations that you've made in your book is that to some extent 2008 the financial crisis uh, its roots lie in something that happened in 1971 Yes. Can you elaborate on that? Okay, so that's a tricky question, given that I wrote the book a while back. Okay, so see, till up until 1971, uh, paper money was linked to gold, and uh, can you explain what you mean by linked to gold? So, uh, you know, what what happened was that uh, as um, over the years, different kinds of uh, commodities were used as money. and uh, you know as you said at the beginning of the show right from everything from you know butter to gold and silver now uh, somewhere along the line uh, paper started to be used as money and i mean without really getting into the details of it this paper was always backed by some commodity in united states uh, tobacco receipts uh, in you know the state of virginia you know virginia tobacco we all know about was used as money for a very long time in fact it was used as money uh, longer than gold was so these receipts could be uh, used to settle uh, you know accounts and they had the backing of uh, some other commodity Uh, so similarly over a period of time uh, you know uh, in i think uh, the bank of england uh, paper money uh, was backed by gold and the master of the mint of the bank of england was a gentleman called isaac newton who we all know i mean which is where he you know he made his money being the master of the mint of bank of england and not uh, doing all the science and the math that he did man's got to earn a living yes so uh, so so there is something about all this uh, in the first volume of easy money and how you know newton did something i mean as a matter of chance rather than you know thinking through it uh, the entire uh, consequences that uh, gold essentially became the currency of choice for bank of england so bank of england used to issue paper notes and these paper notes were backed by gold now once uh, uh, you know the the english sort of uh, started ruling the world other countries like germany also thought that you know gold and the fact that their paper money was backed by gold had some part to play in it so just to clarify what you mean when you say backed by gold is that a specific value was said that so many yes, notes exactly. or so many whatever so, is going to be so it was like uh, i mean i don't remember the exact value right now but you know 1 pound was right. worth a certain amount in gold so the amount of money in the world was therefore limited, limited by the amount of gold. gold yes so what you had to do is essentially at any point of time you could take those paper notes and and you know go to the mint and exchange them for gold and at any point of time you could take gold and exchange them for paper money and what this also therefore means is that because its the amount of money is restricted by the amount of gold that there is that the government can't just like print money Not as at we all. say I mean they yes. couldn't uh, sort of print their way out of uh, you know 
any problems that they faced so basically the success of great uh, britain essentially led to a situation where many more countries in western europe started moving towards gold as uh, their currency and this went on till around 1914 uh, when the first world war started and at this point of time you know the countries which were a part of this war suspended their standards so that they could print as much money was required in order to fight the war now uh, one country which sort of stayed away from the war for a very long period of time was united states and united states uh, from what i remember did not have to suspend the gold standard during the first world war now what happened was in the uh, you know what happened was all these countries had printed a lot of money to fight the first world war and there was suddenly a lot more money in the financial system than gold backing it okay after the war ended and this because of this a lot of uh, you know problems were created and uh, by the time uh, the second world war started Uh, a lot of these uh, countries which had gone back to the gold standard never really sort of uh, recovered from the economic catastrophe that followed the first world war and obviously during the second world war also the uh, gold standard was and what were some of the consequences of sort of deviating from the gold standard during the so, first so world war like i would imagine inflation would be one, one was so one is a you know classic example of uh, you know the german hyperinflation of 1923 which uh, is still date uh, you know the highest inflation an economy has an economy of substantial size i mean if you leave out the hyperinflation of 2008 in zimbabwe uh so you know there were these i don't know if you google you'll see all these people you know taking uh, money in a wheelbarrow to buy bread or there is uh, money being used as wallpaper and you'll get all those kind of pictures uh, there's a great story about uh, which i read many years back in a book uh, authored by a gentleman called adam smith who wasn't the adam smith but someone uh, in the us uh, writing under the pseudonym of adam smith so this uh, adam smith writes a story about uh, another guy called walter levy who was an oil consultant or something like that and walter levy's father it seems had bought an insurance policy in 1903 1903 which matured in 1923 right at the point when the german hyperinflation was on and that the money that that policy gave out was just good enough to buy a loaf of bread or something like that so i mean you can very well imagine you know what happens to uh, you know when uh, when uh, money loses value dramatically over a very short period of time in fact i'll i'll take a slight detour for my uh, listeners you know because uh, a few days back a young person asked me the question that you know if our government doesn't have enough money to spend on schools or whatever blah, why don't blah, blah, they blah. just print why don't they just print more money and what happens is that because you have the ability to print money what happens when you print more money is that the amount of money goes up but the goods and services at that point in time remain the same now it's supply and demand when that happens uh automatically everything becomes more expensive because it's a greater amount of money chasing the same number of goods things becoming more expensive and i'm being kind of simplistic here but this is broadly how it works that when the money supply goes up and there's more money chasing the same number of goods and services things become more expensive that's inflation and inflation always hurts the poor the most therefore they are the people for whom a bag of rice will go from 20 rupees to 40 rupees and you know just making that daily meal becomes a burden which is why uh, libertarians often call inflation a tax on the poor and which is why uh, it's a very dangerous thing that requires a lot of oversight when a government has its hands on the money supply because it's very tempting for the government of any day with short term interest in mind like the next elections to just print their way out of trouble just print more money you know forget about the consequences to the common man especially the poor remember it's not the rich but the poor who get hurt the most sorry for that uh, you know that typical libertarian digression i had to make uh, so let's get back to your story we were so, moving to uh-huh, so 71 we were, we were in the second world war and you know right towards the end of the second world war uh, the countries realized that the monetary system of the world is screwed up and they need to fix it so they sort of met this was towards the end of 1944 when the world war really hadn't ended but it was more or less clear by then that the <coughs> allied forces would beat hitler 
and company so they met uh, at this hotel in um, this place called Bretton Woods in the state of New Hampshire in United States and this is where the new uh, global monetary system so to say was unveiled and in this system you know the United States was at the heart of this uh, system and it sort of uh, promised to uh, you know uh, exchange uh, paper money for gold at the rate of uh, $35 for an ounce of gold. One ounce is uh, around 31.1 grams. So this is how, uh, you know, the new global financial uh, system or the global monetary system was unveiled in the aftermath of the Second World War. And what was the purpose of this? The to purpose bring was basically, you know, what had happened was that during the course of the war, the only country which had any gold a uh, substantial amount of gold left was United States. Right. Every other country was essentially buying stuff from United States. So when you were buying stuff from United States, you know, you were basically, you know, in the end, all the settlement happened in the form of gold. Right. So if your imports from United States were greater than your exports to the United States, you ended up shifting gold to the United States, right? right. So, uh, what happened was because of that, you know, countries like Britain, Germany had very little amount of gold and United States was the only country which had a substantial amount of gold uh, left and... And was the currency of all these countries still backed by gold? So if they Yeah, had everything. So basically everything was... So it was like one uh, pound was worth around uh, $4.87. dollars. So if they had very little gold left, is that the same as saying they were very poor at this point? Uh, government-wise, yes. The government-wise, uh, they yes. had... Uh, yeah. The governments had very little gold left. Hmm. So anyway, so this new financial system was unveiled and... In this uh, system, you know, the U.S. had to essentially promise that uh, it would exchange uh, dollars for gold. Now, this what this did was this gave U.S. an exorbitant privilege, which essentially meant that the U.S. could print all the dollars that it needed, whereas the other countries, in order to ensure that uh, they had those dollars, uh, needed to earn them. Okay. Uh, so what uh, the other thing that happened was that, um, you know, because of this, uh, because dollar was exchangeable into gold, dollar became the international financial uh, currency, okay, uh, which it made sense for countries all over the world to hold their foreign exchange in the you know, in terms of dollars, which is something which continues till this day. And before that, the British pound was the international financial currency. And so this gradually moved towards the dollar. Now, then what happened in the late, uh, you know, mid to late 1960s was that uh, France under Charles de Gaulle uh, started to do very well. And uh, they started earning dollars and they started converting these dollars into gold. And gradually this caught on and a lot of other European countries started doing this. And in the end, you know, you reached a U.S. reached a stage where uh, it had very little dollars left in order to continue exchanging them for gold. The uh, you know the final nail in the coffin came from Great Britain on August 13, 1971, when Britain also demanded that the dollars be uh, converted into gold. On August 15, 1971. Uh, uh, Richard Nixon, who was the then president of United State, States, interrupted a very famous uh, show whose name I can't recall right now. It was in its 12th season and it, it was really uh, followed quite a lot back then. And he interrupted that show, went live on television and uh, told the world that, I mean, he, he said a lot of things. And within those lot of things, he also told the world that the gold window, the dollar gold window has been shut down. So suddenly what happened was that, you know, up until then, the entire currency system had some sort of, uh, you know, co commodity backing it. Now, in on August 15, 1971, that, uh, you know, sort of that uh, arrangement broke down. 
and that essentially freed governments all over the world to print as much money as they wanted to i mean in fact this had already started in a way after the end of the first world war but the the, the, the real break came on august 15 1970 so the shift that gradually happened and the, the the final blow on 71 was really a shift from money being backed by gold to money being backed by trust so money being backed by the uh, government fiat i mean all, right you know, so it depends on how much so you it's know. like you know a, a 10 rupee note is not much different from a 2000 rupee note except for the fact fact that uh, you know the government says that you know the 2000 rupee note is worth 2000 rupees and a 10 rupee note is worth 10 rupees right. the real difference between them is not 1990 rupees so in a sense as as you all know harari says in the book sapiens it's a story it's, it's a, a trust. story we it's, chose it's, to believe yeah, yeah. yeah i mean the only reason people continue to sort of uh, use paper money uh, f- to carry out economic transactions is because they believe it is money in the first place the moment they stop believing it is money exactly they'll stop using it i mean look at something like bitcoins which have uh, you know taken the world by storm i mean uh, bitcoins don't have anything uh, backing them but then a lot of people do believe in uh, bitcoins and because they believe that bitcoin is money bitcoin is money and belief is money and and governments typically inspire a lot more belief so government backed yes. currency obviously is the but see what currency. has happened is uh, okay but we we'll leave it i mean i'll be jumping the gun here because easy money is also linked to uh, the rise of bitcoin so let's go back to 71 when, when uh, nixon delinked the uh, the dollar from the yes. uh, from gold yes. what were the dangers of that and what were the consequences so i mean so the first uh, uh, thing that you know a lot of people said was now that you know the monetary system would collapse and but nothing like that really happened i mean so there was this um, uh, chairman of the federal reserve of united states called paul woker who was the chairman between 1979 and 1987 and he said something to the effect of that uh, you know the belief in dollar as uh, the global financial uh, sort of currency became even more after the uh, you know gold standard was uh, broken so i mean rather ironically uh, this happened but you know one thing that needs to be sort of also said here as to uh, which is something that not many people know that the rise of the dollar as international financial currency was also thanks to saudi arabia which sometime in 1945 uh, got into a sort of an agreement with the united states not saudi arabia but the al saud the the saud al saud family <clears throat> got into an arrangement with uh, uh, roosevelt who was the president of us at that point of time that they will uh, sell oil in terms of dollars now you know oil is a commodity which every country in the world needs and not every country uh, sort of produces it you know not every country has oil i mean like right. india almost imports 80% of the oil that it needs now what that did was once saudi arabia and then the opec started buying and selling oil in terms of dollars every country in the world needed dollars so when every country needed dollars what they also had to do was when they sold their exports they had to price them in dollars so saudi arabia played a very important part uh in ensuring the dollar became the global financial currency in fact if you if you remember a few years back barack obama was uh, you know had come to india and he had to suddenly leave because the saudi arabian king died and uh, i mean so this is all about oil i mean the only reason Maybe why he got a bad tummy no 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 he he, he went to saudi arabia I'm so kidding, yeah. <laughs> so no what i'm saying is the only reason why uh, the united states puts up with a lot of shenanigans of you know saudi arabia in the middle east is because saudi arabia has the oil so in a sense saudi arabia was uh, one of the reasons for their preeminence in fact yes so there were you know there was some talk in fact in the late 70s and i mean i discussed this in great detail in the book one of the foreign ministers of I- iran uh, had put a pro- proposal to the opec which is the oil cartel to sell oil in uh, in a basket of currencies which would also include the dollar but that somehow never really got pushed through because saudi arabia was always against it and uh, saudi arabia has been always against it primarily because the al saud family which rules uh, saudi arabia has military support of the united states right so so let's get back to linking 71 and what nixon did there with 2008 like okay. if the what happened so basically uh, you know nixon did in a way was that he initiated the entire easy money era 
and sometime uh, by which you mean any time the government wanted more money it just printed it printed. in 1987 a gentleman called alan greenspan uh, took over as the uh, chairman of uh, the federal reserve of the united states and mr greenspan took forward this easy money era wherein he uh, sort of ensured that uh, you know low interest rates prevailed and people borrowed and spent and because of that the american uh, stock markets uh, did very well even though there was a bubble a dot com bubble which ran up till uh, the year 2000 and then burst after that because of low interest rates a housing bubble started and uh, the stock markets also started uh, to do well so uh, essentially you remember i mean correct me if i'm wrong but when uh, there was inflation in the us uh, during the last years of carter's presidency in the 1970s i think paul walker raised the so interest paul, rates so paul walker raised paul the, walker it was the you know the last uh, you know good guy in the american financial system as a lot of austrian school economists like to believe so paul walker uh, in uh, took over uh, as the chairman of the federal reserve in 1979 and he started pushing up interest rates in the hope of killing inflation which in you know which uh, in the post uh, you know 1971 era had reached double digits in the us uh, so he finally over four years of raising interest rates and uh, which obviously also led to uh, jimmy carter losing his presidency uh and a lot of ill will was generated towards the federal reserve during those years between 79 and 82 paul walker managed to kill inflation and to clarify how that would be high interest rates would have led to less people borrowing money and therefore less money out in the system and because there would be less money chasing the same number of goods and services prices would come down the prices o- even if prices don't come down they may not rise at the same rate at, as at, at the same rate as they were earlier and uh, in the greenspan era the low interest rates what they did was they prompted people to borrow more and more money and the money had yes, to go but, somewhere but, and but but uh, but uh, that did not lead to inflation right primarily because the world by then had discovered china as the factory of the world right so uh, you know so essentially the the way it sort of i so, mean so the surplus money went into all these bubbles yes so so the, the there is a sort of a circular arrangement which i sort of discuss in my i think it's there in the third easy money book wherein what happens is that you know the america spent China earned dollars okay then uh, China invested those dollars in to american financial securities including the treasury bonds of the united states and a lot of other private financial securities so when when the chinese invested in the american financial securities uh, the uh, the demand for those securities went up and hence you know the bond yields came down and because of that interest rates were low in the us so when interest rates were low the us consumer american consumer could borrow at low rates and then he could use a lot of that money to ultimately buy chinese goods so it was a very you know uh, so what seemed like a virtuous circle then might even be a vicious I mean, circle it, it was basically a ponzi day. scheme if you look at it in the sense that as long as uh you know the american consumer borrowed and the chinese reinvested i mean it, as long as the chinese ke- keep reinvesting in the us fan- uh, treasuries and the interest rates stayed low uh, the american consumer kept borrowing and the american economy kept doing well i mean obviously i'm simplifying it obviously, a lot yeah. i mean you know the real world really doesn't work as uh, you know simplistically as this but uh, so so yes so getting back so this is how you know alan greenspan and the entire era of easy money sort of continued now what has also happened in the us very very interestingly is that uh, since the uh, i think mid 70s or early 70s the median incomes have not really moved okay so which has led to a situation wherein uh, you know the politicians like low interest rates because that you know people can borrow again at low interest rates housing prices can go up so even though the salaries of people are not going up because the home prices keep going up people tend to feel a little wealthy okay and which is something that politicians like so this is you know another angle to it wherein because the us over the years has stopped manufacturing stopped making things uh you know the median income hasn't really gone anywhere but that's a different debate for a different day uh 
So obviously after the the dot com bubble went burst in 2000 an, a new bubble in the form of uh, the housing bubble uh, came to the fore and in this housing bubble there was something known as the subprime loans which came to the fore now what had happened was because you know the banks were ultimately running out of people to lend money to banks and other financial institutions so they had to create a new level of borrowers now prime borrowers were good borrowers to whom you uh, lent money uh, because you felt that they were in a position to return it the subprime borrowers basically were the borrowers below the uh, prime borrowers who normally would not have uh, gotten a home loan or any other kind of loan for that matter but given the fact that they were just uh, there was too much money sloshing around in the system and loans had to be given so a subprime category was created uh, so i'll just interrupt you here and talk about um, you know earlier you mentioned politics and how politics drove a lot of this earlier on political incentives and one of the things that came out of that was something called the community reinvestment act I don't know if this was in the late 60s or the late 70s I can't can't quite remember but the community reinvestment act basically uh, mandated that uh, uh, lenders have to give a certain percentage of their loans yes. to people who would so, not otherwise yes, get credit yes. so they were basically uh, you know quotas depending on areas quotas depending on income and all those kind of things were there what also happened was that uh, the american financial sector discovered something known as securitization Right. Now securitization added to this entire easy money bubble. Now what what happens is typically when a bank gives a loan, uh, it you know keeps that loan on its books, and uh, over the years as the AMIs get paid, uh, a part of the principal is returned, and interest is also paid on that loan. Uh, in case of securitization, what the banks and other financial institutions did was you know let's say they had. Uh, you know given a home loan at the rate of 8% now they issued financial securities against that uh, home loan which uh, paid let's say an interest of 7% and those financial securities were then sold off to other investors so what it did was that the bank instead of holding the money on to its balance sheet got the money back up front and it could then lend the money all over again and not just that it bundled bunches of loans yes, together which, subprime so it bundled loans, a lot of uh, yeah. so what also happened was because uh, you know the interest in case of uh, uh, the investors was because a lot of these loans were subprime loans so they were essentially giving a rate of return which was better than a lot of other loans and uh, you know these were triple a rated uh, securities which is another thing to point out the rating agencies were actually paid uh i mean i mean their money came from the companies yes so and, what, and what, what happened exactly was this is you know very interesting that uh, the amount of uh, money that rating agencies made on uh, i mean i mean i remember this vaguely uh, they they made at least three times the money rating a subprime loan than a normal loan so hence uh, you know it was in their interest to keep uh, anyone who was issuing those securities happy because there were three i think government approved rating agencies in the us so you know instead of going to one you know instead of let's say going to snp the guy could have gone to moody's right so you you so, got yes, to so, the so rating there the is a fundamental points. problem in the entire rating game so because of that uh, so banks got their money back uh, because of securitization the bank no longer had to hold on to the loan on its books now what that did was that you know the entire structure which was in place in order to ensure that you give loans to only people who returned those loans i mean you had loan officers who did that sort of thing that went out of the window because the moment you did not have the loans on your book you know it did not matter you know any anyone your else your incent so all those loan officers were fired and i mean when all that's there in the book so uh, so ultimately because all this money was being lent there was a huge bubble in the american in housing market now this is just one part of the story the other part of the story so the bubble was because banks kept lending to subprime customers because they could easily get the loans off their books because of high ratings given by rating agencies they were paying to begin with right and a part of the reason that they could give so many loans was because of low interest rates and the easy money in the system right so you know in in the us other than home loans uh, there is another kind of loan called the home equity loan 
so what that does is uh, let's say you bought a house for let's say hundred thousand dollars and uh, over a period of time the value of the house has increased to hundred fifty thousand dollars so you have uh, something known as a home equity which is the difference between uh, the current value of the house and the home loan outstanding on it so let's okay. say a home loan outstanding on that hundred fifty thousand dollar house is eighty thousand dollars so your home equity is seventy thousand right. dollars so you can borrow against that home equity also to pay off the original amount no I mean you can do it anything okay. I mean, that's just right. a normal you can go buy hmm. you know consumer goods or what Whatever. Right. So what this entire bubble did, so it was a bubble at two levels, you know, one was the home loan bubble, then the other was the home equity loan bubble. Okay. So a lot of people took on these home equity loans and, uh, and then, you know, bought consumer goods or, you know, goods that were being imported from China and so on and so forth. So that all of this essentially, you know, ensured that the US economy kept chugging along and it did not have to sort of face the negative consequences of the dot com bubble going bust in 2000. So all this went along very, very final, you know, and but then as you know, is the case with uh, any bubble, you know, people ultimately, if you give them more money than they have the ability to repay, started to default. And once they started to default, uh, you know, a lot of these uh, investors who had also borrowed money to buy all these securitized financial securities started getting into trouble. Uh, and the first, uh, you know, two hedge funds of uh, investment bank called Bear Stearns, which was the fifth largest investment bank on Wall Street, went bust sometime in 2007. And Bear Stearns was finally sold to JP Morgan in March 2008. Eight. This was uh, the first sort of big uh, thing that happened. And I think it, as Andrew Ross Sorkin describes in Too Big to Fail, it was basically all the banks coming together saying, hey, what do we do and we need to do yes. something about these guys. And that's how the deal yes. happened. So, another, so over the next six, seven months, uh, uh, you know, so obviously uh, once the fifth largest bank went uh, was sold off, the next guy on the line was Lehman Brothers. But, uh, you know, from what I can understand, uh, having read up about the entire entire era, uh, the CEO of Lehman Brothers, a gentleman called Richard Fuld, F-U-L-D, I don't know how to pronounce it, uh, was always of the belief that given that the Fed had rescued or at least initiated the rescue of Bear Stearns, they would rescue Lehman Brothers also. But for some funny reason, I've tried really sort of understanding as to why they let Lehman Brothers go given that they rescued almost everyone else, I really haven't been able to come to a conclusion. But, I mean, long story short, next Lehman Brothers went bust and everything started to go haywire. And then the Federal Reserve decided to sort of start printing money uh, in order to ensure that the uh, American economic uh, recovery is fast. So now, before I ask you to continue the story from here, I'll just try and sum up this period very briefly and tell me if I've made a mistake. Uh, the housing bubble happened because a lot of loans, both in terms of home loans and home equity loans, uh, as you explained, uh, were made that wouldn't otherwise have been made if you went purely by creditworthiness. Right. Now, the reasons they were made were manifold. One of them, as I pointed out, were perverse incentives put in place by the so, government. So, like the yes, so basically because, you know, the median income wasn't really rising. So the right. government had to do something else. So the government had to do something. So number one, there was a Community Reinvestment Act which mandated that a lot of these people make these kind of loans to people they otherwise would not make these loans to. Right. And which were also, you know, uh, Fannie and Freddie, which are government So Fannie and Freddie Mac were essentially what their role was that uh, largely... They bought out these securitized loans from uh, all these guys who were making these loans. Right. So ultimately, what used to happen? Let's say I'm a small subprime lender, and I was like, you know, I'm. I always had the option of selling off uh, these uh, subprime loans to Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, who would buy them, and they were explicitly backed by the government. Right. So what really happened here was, again, to summarize, you had a whole bunch of loans which were made which shouldn't have been made. Why were they made? Number one, for political reasons, the government put in place a Community Reinvestment Act, which mandated that these people have to uh, lend to people who were otherwise not creditworthy. Uh, number two, you had easy money flooding the system, which was enabled by uh, the US going off the gold standard and Nixon's decision in 71. And what that easy money did was that because of low interest rates, people had access to a lot of money, uh, banks and financial institutions, which they used to uh, merrily 
make more of these loans and number 3 what also enabled them to make all of these loans uh, was the fact that they were able to bundle them into these uh, securities and sell them off further down the road to others i mean it was really like a series of chinese boxes you open one chinese box and there's another smaller one inside and so on and so forth the number 4 because of you know fanny and freddy would buy all these subprime loans whenever you wanted to uh, sell it to them and they were essentially backed by the government what eventually happened later the bailout which was an example of profits being privatized and in that case losses being socialized was something that all these companies essentially understood and you could say that lehman brothers for not being bailed out was simply just unlucky but it was implicitly there as part of the system that hey if something goes wrong the taxpayers are there like the funny thing is fanny may and freddy mac were not government owned i mean a lot of people tend to right but, but there was an explicit sort backing of a, yeah, implicit uh, guarantee which was as it was explicit was it implicit uh it was implicit there was never okay. a explicit guarantee as to but it was taken for granted that they will they will never fail yes, they will yes, always be backed they will be backed by the government right. because uh, you know it was uh, the government which has started both these companies right so, and then so, they had privatized it right so what we have now is the easy money uh, easy money caused a crisis and the response to that crisis as you pointed out was, was more, more easy, easy money. money yes and uh, so basically you know if you if you study the financial history of the united states the you know the uh, they have always managed to come out of an economic crisis by spending their way out of it okay yeah. so which is precisely what they wanted to do this time around as well uh so what happened was that you know uh, the economic policies which were initiated uh, had uh, you know some hope of you know uh, that this was what they hoped to achieve but uh, the economic incentives they created led to something else now uh, when um, when all this money was printed and interest rates were driven down the hope was that american companies would borrow at low interest rates they would expand create jobs uh, pay people money so on and so forth and you know all that you know multiplier effect would kick in and but which what, is a keynesian way of thinking which basically. is a sort of uh, i mean not keen keynesian is government doing it's more it. about spending yeah yes this is more you know from the point spending of view spending easy money ha more the point of view from what uh, you know milton friedman uh, basically uh, so essentially a lot of the way the uh, the us uh, central bank operates comes from what milton friedman thought of what went wrong during the great depression so ben bernanke was essentially a scholar of the great depression and which was one of the reasons why he became the uh, federal reserve chairman uh, and a lot of the thinking of these economists is influenced by milton friedman's writing on the uh, you know great about depression about the money supply can do and yes economy. so his his thing was his basic uh, thesis was that uh, because so many banks went bust the money supply in the system contracted and because of that uh, you know everything went uh, haywire i mean to put it very very simplistically So uh so basically when Ben Bernanke initiated what he did he his thinking was coming from what uh, you know he thought was the right thing to do given what Milton Friedman had written about uh, the great depression not that friedman would have uh, approved of easy money but simply friedman's insight that the interest rate can be used as a lever to manipulate the economy ha, I, in the sense he didn't you know nowhere did friedman you know friedman would obviously have balked at uh, rescuing so many uh, exactly uh, it's, yes it's uh, so many of these private enterprises so anyway so to get back to the point so when this uh, so the hope was that these companies would expand and borrow and expand but what happened was comp- the companies did borrow because the interest rates were low but they borrowed in order to buy back their shares okay now what happens is when a company buys back buy back their shares from the shareholders from the stock market yeah right so when the company buys back shares the total number of outstanding shares in the stock market goes down right. which basically pushes up the earnings per share and because the earnings per share goes up the stock price also goes up because the stock price ultimately is a reflection of uh, and also if the supply of shares in the open market goes down then again that's yeah. another reason for the price yes. to go up so basically uh, and you know the incentive here was that a lot of the top management of us companies had a lot of stock options so they saw this as a very good uh, opportunity to drive up uh, you know their wealth by 
borrowing at the cost of shareholders at a very low interest rate and through easy money pumped into the system ultimately taxpayers money yes so this is essentially a perverse incentive perverse which is, incentives and which was, i mean theft is another yes. word for it so frankly. this was one part now the problem is even though the stock prices went up and uh, the stock market went up but uh, buyback does not create jobs right so the the entire idea of companies expanding and creating jobs and so on and so forth went out of the window because they weren't investing yes yeah, they weren't investing that's one perverse in- incentive which was uh, created the other hope was that people would borrow and spend more but people had already you know done their round of borrowing and in the aftermath of the financial crisis the american household debt actually came down for a few years till it started going up again and if you look at uh, the household debt to gdp ratio it is still uh, you know lower than where it was when the financial crisis started in 2008 so the households did not want to borrow now what happened was that these big financial institutions saw this as a great opportunity to borrow money at low interest rates and invest them in financial markets all over the world and a lot of this money kept uh, you know came into the indian stock market and into the indian bond market so also. is our stock market boom uh, is a large is largely because of uh, if you look at data i mean uh, so american taxpayers have funded our stock market uh, sort boom. of yeah uh, I mean, you can say that so uh, so a lot of the money that came in between 2000 uh 11 2012 2014 uh, was uh, a lot of the fa- foreign institutional investors as we call them investing in india uh 2015 was a negative year for them and then they turned positive in 2016 17 now if you look at conversely uh, at the uh, domestic financial institutions they were selling all along between 2011 and 2015 and they've been buying in the last two years when the markets have peaked sort of so uh so in the sense that you know a lot of this easy money found its way into financial markets all over the world and it drove up uh, you know stock prices and then stock markets and and the crazy venture capital uh, that's also been floating yeah i mean which is well. also another so if you look at uh, you know the, the example that i like to give is that blackstone is the biggest owner of real estate in india which is wow, very right. crazy yeah so i mean the second biggest after the government obviously ha, i mean <laughs> yeah. no, i'm just talking about yeah generally yeah. i mean if you look at the uh, so uh I mean stuff which is there on paper. I mean right. there might be some guy who might own more than Blackstone, Benami. but we don't yeah. know. Huh? Yeah. So, uh, so yes. So all this money that you know coming into the flip cards of the world, and you know we getting huge discounts is also a function of uh, the era of easy money. I mean, so the American taxpayer has funded the discount I got yesterday yeah, when yeah. I bought from Amazon. You can say that. You can say that. Excellent. Yeah. I don't buy from Flipkart, by the way. That was a hypothetical example. Only so, Amazon for me. Yeah. There's so, an unpaid plug. Yeah. So yeah. So if you look at the valuations, you know, price to earnings ratios of the Indian stocks and the Indian stock market, you know it's gone up dramatically in the last couple of years. So which basically means that even though the stock prices are going up, the earnings of companies are not right. going up at so the same. So something's got to give at some yes. point. So, which is how you know. So ultimately, you know, all this uh, sort of has been happening for a while. And in June last year, the Federal Reserve. Uh, essentially said that uh, they will gradually start withdrawing uh, all this money that they have pumped into the financial system and they started doing it sometime in october now between october 3 2017 and january 29 2018 the federal reserve has sort of pumped out around 40 billion dollars which is less than 1% of the size of their balance sheet so the balance sheet now is uh, peaked at around 4.5 trillion dollars in uh, december 2016 when they started off in september 2008 uh, the balance sheet size was around 905 billion dollars so it went up by almost uh, wow. Five yeah, times, yeah. Five times. So ultimately, you know, you have to understand that any central bank does not have any money of its own. So if the size of its balance sheet is going up, it basically means it's acquiring assets. How is it acquiring assets? By printing money. So the balance sheet size went up from around nine hundred billion dollars to four point five trillion dollars. Now this is something that the Federal Reserve is now trying to uh, contract, and it is uh, between September, sorry, between October and in January, it has managed to contract it by around one percent. 
and uh, so obviously the plan is to contract the balance sheet by around 420 billion dollars this year and 600 billion dollars uh, there on so if everything goes uh, as it is supposed to uh, then by the end of this year the federal reserve balance sheet will be down by around 10% and what's the impact of that the impact is basically you know when when the money in the financial system comes starts uh, being uh, sucked out by the uh, pulled out by the federal reserve the, the total amount of money supply goes down and uh, when the money goes supply goes down interest rates start to go up the other issue here is that the American government uh, under Donald Trump is supposed to borrow more than $3 trillion uh, between 2018 and 2020. So what is happening here is that you have the Federal Reserve uh, at, uh, you know, pulling out money. And between 2018 and 2020, they would have pulled out around $1.6 trillion if they keep doing what, you know, they are saying right now. And at the same time, you have the U.S. government wanting to borrow $3 trillion. So a, a government wanting to borrow in a financial system where the money supply is actually contracting uh, is not, uh, you know, the best thing that will happen because all governments like to borrow at low interest rates. So at some point of time, uh, you know, I think uh, the U.S. Federal Reserve will uh, end up in a confrontation with uh, Donald Trump if it continues to do what it is saying it will do. Uh, that whether they'll continue to do it is a you know is so, a big question mark. What's the potential impact of this on a the world economy and b on India because India so also the, the, has. Huh, so what will happen basically is uh, you know if these interest rates start to go up, all the money which these big financial institutions have borrowed and invested in India uh, will start to go out gradually. Primarily because uh, you know as interest rates go up the trades that have been made uh, will start to become unviable. So it will make more sense for them to sort of withdraw money from India and take it back to the... Which is US. not something you'd lament, right? Because it means, you know, the, the, the stock prices will again be more or less sensible. Yes, It'll, but the then, you know, what, what be... happens is, uh, you know, when stock prices fall, falling stock prices have a huge nuisance value. True. Because, uh, uh, you know, people who invest uh, in the stock market uh, are heard much louder by the government than you know people yeah. who invest in fixed deposits. So, to yeah. say. so that is there. So uh, the other big, the bigger threat, uh, as for me, is that you know if money, foreign money, starts to go out of the Indian bond market, then the bond yields will start to go up, and uh, interest rates will start to go up, and interest rates going up will mean EMIs will start to go up, wow. which will hurt more Indians than money going out of the stock market. So, uh, and when the mood around the economy goes down, it's a government of the day which I I inevitably bears a brunt. Yes. So, Modi may actually be unlucky going towards yes, 2019 so, but the for point, factors outside his control. But the point is, you know, the question is whether this will happen or not. I was right, coming maybe. coming to that. Mm. Now, uh, you know, the, the, the beauty of uh, the American system, so to say, is that... Uh, they have a sense of balance, okay? Now, even though you have a Federal Reserve Chairman, the, the, the real decisions are essentially made by the Federal Open Market Committee, which decides on the monetary policy of the uh, nation. Like, you know, in India also, we have recently moved towards a monetary policy committee. So, uh, if the... Uh, in, as interest rates start to go up, and if those rise in interest rates starts to hurt the American economy, then the FOMC might very well take a decision without running into a confrontation with Donald Trump that we do not need, you know, high interest rates as of now. So they can go slow on sucking out money from the financial system. Now, why I say this is because, you know, uh, the median income in the US started to fall from 2008 onwards and only in 2016 has it crossed the level that it was in 2008 so the we are so the american system economic system so to say is at a very nascent stage of a economic recovery now whether the federal reserve will uh, you know risk sort of sabotaging that recovery i mean i don't think so so which is why i feel that you know somewhere towards the second half of this year when the impact of uh, higher interest rates uh, becomes a little more clear than it is as of now. Uh, the Federal Reserve will have to sort of go slow on uh, uh, taking the money out, you know, all this money, printed money that they have put into the financial system, taking that out, they'll have to go slow on it. 
uh, and to be clear it's an autonomous body so they don't have to listen to trump no they don't they don't have to but see what what also happens is that uh, so the theory going around now is that the the new federal reserve chairman uh, has been appointed by donald trump and uh, he is not an economist so he is he is a lawyer and an investment banker so uh, yeah so you you have to take that into account but then again having said that he's just one guy in a committee of he, he doesn't make the decision by himself he can't make a decision by himself so so typically what happens is that uh, you know at least in the ben bernanke and the janet yellen era uh, the uh, the chairman used to have some point of view and then he used to try and get the committee uh to subscribe to his point of view so, so now I'll, i'll take the opportunity to bring you to india but b- before i ask about india's approach towards monetary policy and towards easy money um final um sort of question on the us that what do you think the responsible approach would have been i mean you've uh, shown us through your narrative of how easy money caused the 2008 crisis and the response to it was more easy money which doesn't make any sense what should have been done so you know a good example that i discuss in my book uh, is that of iceland when the three biggest banks of iceland went bust in the aftermath of the financial crisis the government decided to let them go bust and iceland is one of the few economies in europe which has managed to recover a good counter example to iceland is ireland where the government decided to sort of take over the you know the liabilities of the banks going bust and because of that uh, you know the irish economy has been in in the dumps for a while now so uh, so you know the the, the point is that uh, you know in economics there are no experiments Right. Now, uh, if the Federal Reserve had let all these uh, banks go, I mean, if, would that have meant that uh, you know, as Ben Bernanke put it, there would be no uh, financial you know system on Monday? You know, we really don't know. but uh, you know what this has done is that uh, it as you said you know it has sort of created a huge moral hazard and the next time any of these banks are in trouble you know the, the market expects them to it's practically you know, a guarantee of irresponsible yeah, behavior is, is, because you know they get the upside yes. of the risk but not the downside exactly so which is uh, i mean see what what also happens is you know when when you are uh, you know people who are in these decision making uh, positions are much more closer to the guy who's getting whacked at that point of time and peop- and you know guys who are not getting whacked are really not organized to sort of push yeah. their point of view concentrated benefit diffuse yes. cost that's, yes. that's a public yes. choice economics so story. which is uh, which is how it uh, is but then as i said you know iceland again is a very small economy but it is a good example of how a country which sort of let its financial you know sector go actually was able to come out of uh, the crisis much faster than uh, other countries but then you know in economics uh, as you know i mean many years back i had i happened to meet uh, mr yv reddy who was the uh, governor of rbi between 2003 and 2008 and he told me uh, and this was at the point when the financial crisis was just starting and he told me something very interesting he said vivek you know not doing anything is not something a central bank can do they have to do something they feel compelled to act in a crisis exactly so and this is uh, you know it's it's like it's an you know uh, an example that i sort of and i i, I then wrote a piece around this uh, phenomenon a few years later which uh, Doctor uh, Duvari Subaro, you know, used in his book, and he who moved my interest rate. So the example was very simple. You know, in football, the statistics show that you know when a penalty is being taken, it makes sense for the uh, goalkeeper not to jump. and stand where he is because his chances of based on past data his chances of stopping the goal are best if he doesn't jump right but the problem is if he doesn't jump uh, you know for the po- for every time the ball you know when the ball goes towards his right or towards his left he ends up looking very very stupid, stupid. so he has to jump yeah. so if you take the same analogy and you know sort of uh, plonk it onto uh, a central bank they have to do something so not doing anything is not an option 
right so since since you mentioned uh, uh, reddy and subara uh, quick comments on how over the years india has historically looked at monetary policy has our central bank been autonomous and given the independence it should have uh, has the temptation to create easy money uh, something that governments have succumbed to and uh, i mean uh, after the modi government took over there were fears from some quarters that they would lower interest rates and get more money out of the system see this is policy, seen, what what typically which didn't happen no i mean see what what also happens is you know lower interest rates do not automatically lead to right. more borrowing i mean right. there, there is uh, you know a general misconception that you know almost everyone has now in an indian context if you if you look at the post demonetization era uh interest rates have come down okay on fixed deposits on loans but the borrowing hasn't gone up proportionately right. for the simple reason that you know demonetization has hit people badly and it has hit the capacity of people to go out there and uh you know take loans and be able to pay those EMIs. In fact, just to digress, we were discussing at the start of the episode how one of the key features of money, which is backed by the government, is trust in the money. And among the many disastrous thing demonetizations did, one was that it affected that trust. Right? If yes. you have a thousand rupee note, are you actually going to get a thousand rupees for it? Right. Right. So, in fact, one thing we didn't talk about uh, was bitcoins. You know, the rise of easy money and the rise of bitcoins are, you know, very intricately linked because people who, I mean, I'm, I'm talking about the guys who are passionate about bitcoins, not the speculators who've just put money to right. sort of make money out of it. People, Those who are using it as a medium of exchange exactly. rather than so as a speculative asset. People who are passionate about bitcoins are passionate about it because they want control over their money they don't want the government to interfere right. and you know there is a great belief that uh, bitcoin cannot be cracked right. by the governments so vivek uh, i want to talk about bitcoins i want to have a full episode on it so uh, but i'm not the guy that for another day i'm not yeah. the guy <laughs> i'm not a bitcoin guy so Right. Yeah, sure, so, sure. in any case, uh, I mean, talking to you was extremely enlightening. And if uh, if you've listened to this episode so long, you found it as interesting as I did. So, do go out and buy Vivek's books. Uh, and actually, Vivek's books do pretty much what my podcast sets out to do: look beyond the seen effects and see the unseen effects. Vivek, thanks so much for being on the show, man. Thanks, Amit, for having me. In case you enjoyed listening to the show, you can follow Vivek on Twitter at call underscore Vivek. Go to Amazon and check out the Easy Money trilogy right away, and also his latest book, India's Big Government. You can follow me on Twitter at Amit Varma, A M I T V A R M A. Our past episodes, including a few featuring Vivek, are available on SeenUnseen.in. And for more great, cutting-edge Indian shows, do download the IVM Podcasts app and follow IVM Podcasts on Twitter and Facebook. Goodbye for now. If you enjoyed listening to the scene and the unseen, check out another hit show from Indusworks Media Networks, Cyrus Says, which is hosted by my old colleague from MTV, Cyrus Brocha. You can download it on any podcasting network. There she stands, a podcast addict. Outside the bank, having traveled several miles to get in with other poor souls like her. The journey, though daunting for this youngling, will have some comfort because she has downloaded her favorite podcast. You can see more of her species on ivmpodcasts.com, your one-stop destination where you can check out the coolest Indian podcasts. Happy listening.